welcome to the continuous the mcq discussion the session 6 of the pathology mcqs so let us continue the discussion mainly on this general pathology so let us have few questions on the the wound healing intention assess the primary intention and the secondary intention what is the difference and the related questions which is not true regarding granulation tissue options it bleeds on touch it consists of newly formed blood vessels it is a sign of normal healing process more the granulation tissue less will be the scar so remember my friends what is granulation tissue it is the one which consists of predominantly newly formed blood vessels that is seen in the most of the wounds in the process of wound healing process so more will be the granulation tissue what do you expect more will be the scar not less will be the scar so it bleeds easily on touch why it bleeds easily on touch because it consists of friable you know the endothelial cells whatever is there in the newly formed blood vessels they are not very uh, well formed they are very fragile so they are very fragile cells so the, that's why it bleeds on touch classically granulation tissue if you touch it starts bleeding it consists of newly formed blood vessels yes that's the definition of course in the granulation tissue it is a sign of normal wound healing process that's right so more the granulation tissue actually more will be the scar but here option is less will be the scar so that should be the correct answer which of the following not true regarding cutaneous wound healing so let us have the look on the first intention and second intention surgical laparotomy scar will heal by first intention wound of road traffic accidents will tend to heal by secondary intention scar formation will be more with a secondary intention granulation tissue will be more with a primary intention so let us have a look on this diagram here so what is primary intention what is secondary intention so surgical scars example laparotomy scars so they are very classical example for the wound healing by primary intention so a lot of care will be taken while putting the incision over the body right so they will take all the septic precautions they will clean with a the spirit they will clean with the iodine so with all the uh, septic precautions incision will be taken so the amount of granulation tissue that is formed is less the inflammation component is less that's why these uh, uh, incisions will heal with the scant amount of uh, uh, scar formation so because the two ends two surgical ends will be even approximated with the sutures so that's why amount of scar that is formed with the primary tension is less but say this is a road traffic accident case most of the time the road traffic accident case there will be a lot of loss of skin the epithelial surfaces are too far away so it is difficult to approximate the two ends so unless you do the some uh, skin grafting it becomes very difficult and most of the time these are contaminated a lot of bacterial things are there here in the center so it indicates that it is a contaminated wound so the more will be the granulation tissue there will be more the inflammatory cells and more will be the the scar formation so that is the secondary intention so here we have a choice here surgical laparotomy scar will heal by first intention that's right wound of road traffic accidents will tend to heal by secondary intention that's also correct scar formation will be more with a secondary intention that's also correct granulation tissue will be less actually with the primary intention so answer is d granulation tissue will be actually less but here option is given more so that is not true function of matrix metalloproteinases is to what is the function of the matrix metalloproteinases degradation of extracellular matrix prevent granulation tissue formation prevention of interaction of cells to matrix degradation of metals involved in healing so what is the correct answer do you think remember what is the function of this matrix metalloproteinases they are the one which are involved actually in the wound remodeling process remodeling in the sense they are the one which will give proper shape to the wound that actually the shape of the the final shape of the wound is mainly maintained by these uh, matrix metalloproteinases because they contain uh, metals like calcium and even magnesium will be there so that's the one so we'll have a look on the options 
they will not prevent the granulation tissue formation and they will not uh, do prevention of cell to cell interaction the cell to cell cell to matter interaction is most for the wound healing to take place and they will not do any degradation of the metals so they actually what they do excess amount of extracellular matrix that is deposited will be removed by remodeling of the scar by matrix patelloprotein so this is option what is the function they do the remodeling so instead of remodeling they have given the option degradation of extracellular matrix that should be the correct choice in which of the following situation do you expect rapid wound healing process will take place so you should remember what are all the factors that influences the wound healing patient with wound near the knee joint patient who is on corticosteroid treatment patient whose wound is sutured patient with diabetes old age patient without any cancer so in whom there are so many clinical settings here so in whom do we expect rapid wound healing process think about it have a option a here let us see what happens patient with the wound near the knee joint remember if there is a wound near the joints any joint not only knee so any mobility it hampers the wound healing process so any wound which is near the joints which are mobile joints so it actually hampers so wound will be get delayed delayed wound healing will be seen if they are near the joints patient who is on corticosteroid treatment so they are actually immunosuppressed and even diabetic patients are also immunosuppressed immunocompromised so in these two things you cannot expect uh, much proper uh, wound healing but corticosteroid will be given for certain inflammatory conditions to suppress excessive amount of uh, inflammatory process that is going on that's right but who is already on corticosteroid treatment you cannot expect much good healing process patient whose wound is sutured so it the sutured means a lot of care might have been taken there right so they will not suture just like that they will take all aseptic precautions they will approximate the two ends of the wound so s yes, that is answer patient in whom the wound is sutured old age patient whether with cancer or without cancer they will have immunosuppression again so immunity goes down as the age advances so the correct answer would have been patient whose wound is sutured that's the correct answer yes let us have a look how much time do you think is essential to attain a tensile strength of 70 to 80% for laparotomy scar so suppose imagine you have become a surgeon and you have done a one patient a laparotomy have done and you should advise how much time the patient has to take a rest that means patient should not you know lift lift any weight heavy weight if the patient lifts then there is a chance that uh, that wound can even you know it can cause a hernias or it can cause a laceration of that wound so how much time is required to attain a tensile strength of up to 80% one week three week one month three months one year so minimum time that is required to attain tensile strength of 70 to 80% yes correct answer so just do you think one one week is enough three week is enough in one month yes it attains almost up to you know 30 to 40% or maximum 50% but not 70 to 80% minimum 3 months is required yes at least you should tell the patient that for 3 months patient should not do any uh, no should not lift any heavy things uh, so otherwise it can cause you know the uh, hernias and other complications of the laparotomy scar so minimum 3 months is required to attain a tensile strength of uh, 80% microscopically keloid consist of what dense granulation tissue formation dense acute inflammatory cell infiltrate dense chronic inflammatory cell infiltrate dense deposition of collagen so what dense is there correct for the keloid so what is keloid keloid is very very common outcome especially in a black population so what is this keloid consist of it is nothing but hypertrophied scar we indians are very prone for this keloid formation in even uh, african setup you will see more keloid formation so the ear prick injuries the nose prick injuries so all those things can have a keloid so what is keloid microscopically it consist of hypertrophied scar so scar is what deposition of the collagen tissue so answer is 
dense deposition of the collagen so if at all you take a section of the colloid and look under microscope you will see haphazardly arranged collagen bundles under microscope so it is excessive deposition of the collagen tissue that's why you will use the word hypertrophied scar thrombus formation takes place during options primary hemostasis secondary hemostasis tertiary hemostasis soon after injury to the endothelial cells so you should know what will happen in the primary hemostasis what will happen in the secondary hemostasis what will happen in the tertiary hemostasis primary hemostasis is the process where endothelial cells will be get damaged soon after the injury so platelets will come and accumulate in the primary hemostasis once platelet comes there they keep on releasing the granules they change their shape but platelet plug will be formed in the primary hemostasis in secondary hemostasis there is a deposition of the fibrin what is fibrin it's the end product of the coagulation cascade so fibrin is the one which makes this particular uh, platelet aggregates in a tight uh, package so it is the one which entangles that particular mesh of platelets so it is like a threads you no know, it binds all those platelets and make it a little bit stable right so that is happens in the secondary hemostasis tertiary hemostasis where more and more wbc is also will come there no wbc will come and the neutrophils will get entrapped in that uh, uh, thrombus formation and the even more and more uh, fibrin will deposition will take place so thrombus is nothing but uh, it is a, a component of a tertiary hemostasis that you have to remember thrombus will be formed in the tertiary hemostasis tertiary hemostasis is the correct choice that is a correct option all the following are natural anticoagulants except we have options here a antithrombin 3 b protein c c thrombomodulin d one elaborant factor so you should remember my friends which are uh, procoagulants and which are anticoagulants so that's the one which is uh, you need to remember endothelium is having both uh, procoagulant activity as well as the anticoagulant activity so these among all these choices all are natural anticoagulants except so remember what is the function of one elaborant factor it is a friend of platelets platelets will come to the subendothelial collagen and platelets will bind to the subendothelial collagen with the help of van elebrand factor so that's a procoagulant van elebrand factor is a procoagulant not a anticoagulant so platelets and van elebrand factor van elebrand factor is a bridge between the platelets and the subendothelial collagen so that's a procoagulant so the other options antithrombin 3 protein c protein s thrombomodulin they are all the example of the anticoagulants so our answer should be van elebrand factor yes the next question bernard solier syndrome is due to deficiency of which of the following remember it's all one of the rare cause of the bleeding disc tendency bernard solier syndrome it's due to the deficiency of what van elebrand factor glycoprotein 1b glycoprotein 2b 3a complex factor 8 answer yes it's quite easy van elebrand factor deficiency is called as van elebrand disease factor 8 deficiency you know that it is a hemophilia so you are now left out with the two entities now right glycoprotein 1b or glycoprotein 2b 3a complex remember the bernard solier syndrome is due to glycoprotein 1b and we have one more syndrome that is due to the glycoprotein 2b 3a complex what is that glanzmans remember here last question here glanzmans thrombocytopenia is due to so remember it is due to the deficiency of glycoprotein 2b 3a complex so remember this particular diagram is useful for you to define the various disorders so whenever there is a subendothelial injury the subendothelial collagen is get activated so endothelial injury results in the exposure to the subendothelial collagen that makes more and more platelets to come change their shape and accumulate and platelets will have various molecules on their surface glycoprotein 1b is there and as well as 2b 3a complex is there over the platelets so with the help of the van elebrand factor that acts as a bridge between the platelets and the subendothelial collagen more and more platelets will come and accumulate and deficiency of van elebrand factor is van elebrand disease deficiency of glycoprotein 1b is called as bernard solier syndrome and deficiency of 
Glycoprotein 2b 3a complex is Glanzmann thrombosthenia. That is weakness in the attachment of the platelets. So all these three MCQs you can answer once you remember this particular uh, diagram. So that's a nice uh, diagram to explain all these three disorders. So we'll have more continuous discussion in the next session. Thank you.